Good morning, like minds. It's a lovely morning and uh, lovely to be here in Exeter. The good news is, that in order to make my presentation even more exciting, we're going to have a little quiz. And whoever gets the most questions right will win a copy of this book. It's incredible, isn't it? So, so get your pencils and papers ready and I'll give you the quiz questions as we go along and see how well you know your innovator. So we're going to go through and... Um, this is the first innovator. Do you know his name? If you do, write it down. He uh, is a Scottish doctor who pioneered sterilization, and he is the only person in this uh, list of exemplars who has a mouthwash named after him. There's a clue. So write down the name of this person, if you know him. Doctor, write it down. <laughs> All right. Uh, and the answer is... And if you have any, that's time's up now. The answer is Joseph Lister. Um, in 1865, an 11 year old boy called James Greenlees was run over by a cart in Glasgow and he had a multiple fracture of his leg. He was taken to the Royal Infirmary at Glasgow. And in those days, if you had a multiple fracture, the likely result would be amputation or infection, possibly death. But Greenlees was very fortunate because the doctor who treated him was Joseph Lister. And Joseph Lister had, at that time, doctors believed that um, infection was caused by bad air. But uh, Lister had studied the work of Louis Pasteur, who found that uh, uh, organisms in the air can rot food. And he'd also studied the work of another doctor who'd found that carbolic acid uh, stopped the rotting of corpses. And so he treated uh, the boy, and then he, he get, covered the wound in lint soaked in carbolic acid. And he came back four days later to examine the wound. And normally at that time there'd be infection. There was no infection. He wrote up his results in the Lancet, and he recommended that doctors should sterilize their hands, the, the instruments, their aprons, everything. At that time, common practice among doctors was not to wash anything. The hand, they didn't believe it. So the same tools they'd use on one patient, they'd use on the next, the same scalpel, the same saw, whatever it was. They went from, and they caused countless infections. And there was resistance from the medical community. And the point about the story really is this, that the doctors at that time were the most educated people in society, the most intelligent, the most, and they were carrying out these practices which seem almost barbaric to us today. And what a standard practice today will be obsolete tomorrow. People will look back in 50 years' time and say, in 2022, people were still doing X. Did they not realize that Y was so much better? And they're still invading countries. That's incredible. So that's the first thing, is challenge existing practices. Now then, you know, you'll do very well if you know this guy. He was at IBM. He is known as the father of the IBM PC. He was the person who created the IBM personal computer. I worked for IBM in the 1980s. And at that time, IBM was uh, the leader in mainframe computers. But they noticed that little companies like Atari, Commodore, and Apple were selling personal computers. And they said to this man, have you written down his name? No? It's a tough one. His name is Don Estridge. And Don Estridge, they said, design an IBM personal computer for us. And he realized that at that time, IBM's uh, methodology was it did everything. It built its own power supply, its own motherboards, its own processors, its own operating systems, everything. And if he followed the IBM normal practice, the product would be over-engineered, it would cost too much, it would take years to bring to market. So he broke every rule in the IBM rulebook. He went outside for the operating system, thereby making Microsoft's fortune. He went outside for the processor, thereby making Intel's fortune. And most... Uh, Incredible of all, he created an open architecture system. Up until then, everything IBM did was proprietary. It was closed. Only IBM knew what was in the side of the computer and how it worked. But he made this completely open. He published the specification so that anybody could add cards and boards to expand, expand. It became a platform. And he brought the product to market in less than a year. It was unheard of. And it was a huge success, not because it was the best PC, but because it became a platform that everyone else copied and used. IBM PC compatible, you remember, may remember. And in 1984, he was offered um, presidency of Apple by Steve Jobs. He turned it down. In 1985, he and his wife were killed in a, car cr in a plane crash in Texas. And at that time, the time of his death, if the IBM PC had been a separate company, it would have been the third largest computer company in the world behind IBM and DEC. So it was a huge success. In 
Um, and he did it by breaking all the rules. He was applauded for it. All right. Do you know who this man is? A Finnish man. And he is the only person in the whole list to have an operating system named after him. There you are. There's a big clue. If you know who he is, write it down, please. His name is Linus Torvalds. And he created, when I was in, in Ashton Tate, the, the, the unwritten rule was that the source code of your programs was the crown jewels. It was your intellectual property, closely guarded secret. Only a handful of programmers ever saw it. And it was the same with Microsoft, with Oracle, with IBM. Everybody kept their source code very closely guarded because if somebody could copy that, they could steal your intellectual property. And Linus Torvalds said, what would happen if we did the exact opposite? If instead of making it secret, we made it open, we made anybody, anywhere, can see every line of code. And he did that. He created Linux. Um, and uh, by doing that, he lost control. Right? Anybody could do But he unleashed a torrent of creativity because people were all tinkering and improving it. And it's gone on to be uh, the most popular operating system in the world now. It's the foundation of um, Android. Okay. All right, and an easy one. But do you know who this woman is? She founded the Body Shop in Brighton in 1976. Write down her name, please, if you know it, in the quiz. Yeah, come on, guys. And um, the husband, without oh, weight trekking, she, she founded the Body Shop in order to create some income for herself and her daughter. And she did a lot of interesting things. She broke all the rules of conventional retail for cosmetics. In those days, cosmetics perfumes, shampoos, in very fancy packaging, beautiful glass bottles, uh, made with a lot of, uh, uh, very expensive, a lot of chemicals in there. She made very simple products from organic materials, and, and she put them in little plastic bottles, because they were the ones she could get. Some of them were urine sample plastic bottles. And she said people can have refills. Nobody had ever done this before. A refill for a perfume? Never been done before. She created the body shop, and her name is... Anita Roddick. Um, and it became a sensation. Well, she, she put, when she opened the first shop in 1976 in Brighton, it was between two funeral parlors, believe it or not. And they complained. They said, are you taking the mickey? I mean, call it the body shop. between." And, and they tried to stop. Um, but she turned it to her advantage. She went to the local press. And it became a national news story. This, uh, she said, I'm being a, a, a woman entrepreneur, and I'm being oppressed by these big foot companies. It got a lot of, a lot of people turned up. What is this shop? Got her a lot of publicity, and it became a movement. She became an evangelist, a spokesperson for fair trade and, and environmental issues, and so on. Um, and the, the the body shop grew like crazy uh, as a franchise. There were two thousand body shops around the world before she sold it to L'Oreal in two thousand and six for six hundred and fifty million, I think it was. Okay, so she broke all the rules again. Uh, she challenged assumptions. Uh, this man is the creator of the Odon device. He's an Argentinian car mechanic. I wonder if you can guess his name or think of his name. We'll write down if you, if you think you might know who this is. Um, and I love this story. I'm going to tell you the story of this man who's called George Odon. His friend came around one night and his friend said, here's a challenge for you. How do you get a cork out of an empty wine bottle? Take an empty wine bottle, push the cork inside. How do you get it out? And George said, I don't know how you do that. And his friend said, well, I'll show you. It's on YouTube. And you can look on YouTube and you'll see. And the way you do it is you put a plastic bag in through the neck of the bottle and you jiggle the cork around until it's just in the, in the plastic. Then you slightly inflate the plastic and you can pull the cork out. And he went to bed that night thinking about this. In the middle of the night, he woke up with a brainwave. He said, getting a cork out of a bottle is like getting a baby out of a mother's birth canal if it's stuck. It's a very similar problem. And the same principle that could be used to get this cork out of a bottle could be used to get a baby out of the birth canal. And he went away and he created a, he created a prototype using his daughter's doll and a plastic bag. And he came up with something which he called the Odon device. Here it is. Um, and uh, he patented it in uh, 2006, and then Beckton Dickinson agreed to manufacture it, and now it's in use in uh, countries all around the world. 
Because it's very simple. It's clean. It's cheap. It's easy. And it works. And it's saved many lives. And the point of the story is this. He didn't approach the problem of birth, a, a, a difficult childbirth, as a medical problem, as any doctor would. He said, it's a mechanical engineering problem. I'm a car mechanic. I'm going to use a mechanical engineering solution for this. So instead of thinking like a doctor, think like a car mechanic. Whatever you are, can you think in a different mode? Can you be an outsider in your own environment? Because that's what innovators are. Typically, they use outsider thinking. Next on the list is the only African on the list. Do you know who this man is? Write down his name, please. And you get a bonus point if you can name any year in which he was alive. Any of the years in which I write down, write down his name, please. One of the greatest military strategists of all time, Rome's greatest enemy. And when he was, have you got a year? Have you written anything down? Who was it? Hannibal, the original Hannibal. Do you go to it between 247 and 182 BC? And at the age of uh, 28, he was made general in the Carth Carthaginian um, army. His father was a general. Um, and th at that time, Carthage occupied Spain. And he wanted to attack Rome, the biggest power of the time, by a mile. And he took an army. He did something nobody had ever done before, and nobody's ever attempted since. He took an army through the Alps, round from Spain all the way through the Alps, and attacked Rome from the north, where they weren't expecting it. He had nearly 40,000 infantry. 8,000 cavalry, and he took with him 38 elephants. And these were battle-hardened elephants with sharpened tusks. The Romans had never seen elephants before. Never seen them. Well, they face them in battle. And when these things charged at you, they made a big noise, and they were pretty scary. They didn't all make it over the Alps, of course, because uh, it was a terrible journey. And he attacked Rome from the north, and he surprised the Romans and, Romans and terrified the Romans. And he stayed in Rome for the next uh, seven or eight years uh, in, in Italy. And he, he, he was very skillful at getting the local tribes to ally with him. He fought the Romans in, in three big battles, and he won each time, the most famous being the Battle of Cannae in 218 BC, where he made this famous decision. He put his best troops on either, either flank and his weakest troops in the middle. And there were 50, he was facing 50,000 Roman soldiers. And as the Romans advanced, he told his centre to fall back and the centre fell back and fell back. The Romans came on, came on, and then the flanks then closed them. 50,000 Romans died that day. It's the, one of the greatest military strategies ever seen. And it's taught in military academies all around the world to this day. And many great... Um, Generals model themselves on Hannibal, and in fact, George Patton thought he was the reincarnation of Hannibal. Right. So, next we have a Bangladeshi, and this Bangladeshi uh, professor of economics who won the Nobel Prize for his invention of microcredit and microfinance. Do you know who this man is? Yeah, you're trying to remember, aren't you? Yes. Um, so he studied in America, and then he came back to the University of Chittagong, where he became professor of uh, economics. And he took a group of students on a field tour in 1974, and they met a woman who was making bamboo chairs. And she was very good at making the chairs, but she had to borrow money for each chair to buy the materials. 20 cents she had to borrow from a money lender who charged her an extortionate rate. And he thought there was an opportunity to make loans to people like that. And if, if, the, if it was done on a large scale, it would have a big impact. And he started with his own money. He started with $40 of his own money. He lent it without any collateral. Um, and he said banks should do this. No bank was interested. He broke all the rules of banking. With banks, you have to fill in a lot of forms. There's a minimum loan, probably something like $500,000. $500, and you needed security. You, know, you put your house on the line, I'll lend you some money. These women couldn't do that. So he started his own bank, the Grameen Bank, in 1984. And they, they made hundreds of loans, thousands of loans, eventually millions of loans, often to groups of women who were co-guarantors. And they'd buy a cow or start a t-shirt store or something. And it transformed entrepreneurship in Bangladesh and then ultimately in, uh, it was copied in many countries around the world. His name is Muhammad Yunus, still alive. He won the Nobel Prize. And then he fell out of favor with the Bangladeshi government because he criticized them for corruption and they removed him from the bank and... and uh, ostracized him in various ways. 
And my final exemplar is this man. Um, I'll tell you his name because you probably won't know it. He is Paul McCready, an aeronautical engineer. So the question is, what did he invent? He invented something which won a prize. Write down what you think Paul McCready invented. He was world gliding champion at one stage. And um, in 1974, he invested in a startup and it failed. He was left with a big debt and he wanted to pay off the debt. And he looked around and there was a prize at that time offered by an English businessman called Henry Creamer for the first person who could invent a human powered airplane. That's what he invented. And at that time, it, no one had won it. Lots of people had tried to design this. But to, to win the prize, you had to fly this uh, human, by human power only in a figure of eight in a distance of one mile above the ground, 10 feet above the ground. And various people managed to get things up, and, but they couldn't steer it. They couldn't do the figure of eight. And he started, he, he had attempted this, and he, he built something which was a completely different design. It was based on a hang glider. The steering mechanism was in the front. There was a gondola underneath that the, the pilot sat in. Uh, and pedaled. There were bicycle parts and um, plastic, and that was it. But the approach he used, the other people had a lot of skilled engineers. He was a skilled engineer, but his approach was fly, crash, adapt. He flew, it crashed, he changed it. It was what we now call a fast feedback loop. So they went out, they flew it, it would crash. They make changes. They actually cut the, the tail flap and they used cardboard and bits of uh, masking tape to, to change the actual design of the plane there and then. And eventually, in 1977, he won the prize, the hundred thousand dollar prize, and he became the uh, the winner, uh, 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 the first person to invent a human powered air, airplane. And he went on to create uh, another version, uh, which flew across the channel and won another prize. And this is the actual first plane, the Gossamer Condor, it's called. It's in the Smithsonian Museum. That's what it looks like. Very huge wingspan, but very, very light. And it could take off with human power only. So how are we doing? All right. Think like an innovator. So here's my summary for you. Here are my tips for you. First of all, challenge assumptions. Every assumption that you make all the time you need to think about very carefully. Mark Twain said this. He said, what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we think we know for sure. The things you know for sure are the most dangerous things you know because you never question them. Customers will never buy that. This won't work. You, the assumption, those assumptions are very, very dangerous. And great innovators challenge assumptions all the time. Just like Joseph Lister, the assumption that you don't wash your instruments. Or like Don Estridge, the assumption that you have to build everything in a proprietary fashion. Do the opposite. If everyone else is facing this way, deliberately face this way. Edward de Bono said, you can't look in a new direction by staring harder in the same direction. If I'm staring down here, I can't see what's up. I can't, no matter how hard I stare, I've got to turn. David Bowie said, turn and face the strange in his song Change It. That's what I want you to do. Turn and face the strange. And that's what Linus Torvalds did when he did built the exact opposite of, um, of an operating system. Take it outside a point of view. All right? Instead of thinking like a doctor, think like a car mechanic. And if you're a car mechanic, think like a doctor. T t deliberately take it out. And there are techniques you can use to do this. I teach them in my workshops. Techniques that to deliberately displace you and make, make you come up issues from a separate, separate direction. Think big and think small. Hannibal thought big. Huge army, round the top, we're gonna to attack Rome from the north. Yonas, Mohammed Yonas thought small, micro loans, tiny credit, tiny loans without any security. What's the biggest version of your idea? What's the tiniest version of your idea? And finally, fly crash, adapt. Once you've got an idea, the big concept in, in innovation these days is a minimum viable product. A minimum viable product is the smallest, crappiest version of this thing that you can build, that you can take out and show to customers and get their feedback. The purpose of your prototype is not fast payback, it's fast feedback. You want to get a prototype out there, find out what the customers, the, the influential people think, and they'll say, yeah, I like this, but don't like that. And then you adapt. 
You fly, you crash. You fly, you crash, and eventually. And the, the whole reason he could fly, crash, adapt was he never flew more than that. The plane never flew more than about 15 feet off the ground. So when it crashed, there were no, nobody was hurt. So you want to develop something which you can fly at low level, and then when it crashes, it's not catastrophic for your business. <laughs>